Shana, good evening, everyone. Let me make an adjustment here. All right. There we go. Shana, welcome to our Wednesday night class together. I am going to open up with the usual prayer, the short prayer that I've been doing for a couple of months now. I'm going to do it in Aramaic. Shall we pray? Al Haile Ruhe Maran Ishwam Shika Misharenan Milap Milte the Mari Alaka Haya. All right. Now tonight I'm going to begin with something special because this was requested of me. Uh, it was sent in to the foundation, and so I, it was a good idea. So I'm going to do a little bit of it. And you might want to get a pencil and paper to write these scriptures down. Uh, but it's okay if you don't, but I'm going to give you several scriptures here, and I'm going to go into them in a minute. The reason why I'm giving you these scriptures is because of the way certain people still refer to the Bible itself as they're saying the bible says the bible says and then they will quote a scripture and they make it almost that if you don't obey what the bible is saying you're going to be in trouble and so what i thought i would do is put down some of the things that they're saying the bible says you're going to be surprised here are the books chapter and verses okay the first one is going to be job the 12th chapter and the sixth verse job 12 6 the next one's going to be job 31 10 job 31 10 the next one is easy to remember it's one of my favorites years ago when i did lectures on scriptures, just on the scriptures themselves, without going too much into the custom, but just the difference in scripture. I used to say this all the time. And it was, this is one of my favorite ones that I always like quoting. And it's Psalm 7 11. <laughs> it's easy to remember. Psalm 7 11. Psalm 7 11. And the next one will be Isaiah. 43 28 and we're going to i'm going to read these verses to you then there is jeremiah 4 10 jeremiah 4 10 then we'll go into the new testament first corinthians 7 18 first corinthians 7 18 and the next one is 2 Timothy 3.16. I hope we can get to all of these um, before we start to get into your questions. So the first one, uh, I'm going to read to the King James. This is what the King James says. Now, this is what the Bible says. <laughs> okay. Most of the time when people quoted the Bible, it was usually, and when I was lecturing in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, when I had established different schools all over the state of Texas on a weekend night for the Aramaic, and um, this is when I started doing that. And I did a lot of research work because of what I did on these scriptures, but I'm not going to go into all that, just to give you a taste of the difference here. Okay, in the King James Version, in the very first one, Job 12, 6, it says this, the tabernacles of robbers prosper. The tabernacles of robbers prosper. And they that provoke God, that make God angry, are secure. 
Isn't that interesting? So he's telling us, Job is saying, look, the tents of robbers are just absolutely prospering. And they provoke God, but they're secure. And then he closes it with, into whose hand God bring it abundantly. In other words, these robbers, these bandits, these thieves are prospering and they are secure because God brings abundantly into their hand. And I forget when I was a young minister and I found that scripture, I thought that can't be so. God is prospering them. So I did a lot of research because I had a lot of different translations of the Bible. Some of them I kept. I have it here in my library here. And I've been getting rid of a lot of books. I had over 3,000 books. I already started giving some to the libraries and different things like that. I'm getting rid of it to cut down on all the books that I have here. But I kept some translations. So I also have Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, let's see what the Hebrew scholars say about this one. And it's amazing. This is the, this is the Jewish study Bible. And it's supposed to have been, oh, the number one on the Tanakh, and on the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So let's see how they translate that. 12.6. Robbers live untroubled. Oh, yes, I'm sure they do. In their tents. <laughs> so... Forget about prospering. Here they change it completely. They, they live what? They live untroubled in their tents. Then it says, and those who provoke God are secure. Now that's the same as the King James. Because it's referring to these robbers and thieves and bandits. And those who provoke God are secure. But that last verse where it says, and God brings abundantly into their hands in King James it's a little different. And it says, those, those whom God's hands have produced. Hmm. What in heaven's name does that mean? Those whom God's hands have produced? God's hand has produced all this? That the robbers are untroubled in their tents and those who provoke God are secure? God has done that. Oh, yes, that's exactly what God has done. Let me tell you, I read it in the Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, it's gibberish. You can't even figure it out. They're guessing what it means here. They're trying to figure it out. At least the King James says, into whose hand God brings abundantly. But this doesn't even make sense. And so I'm going to put this here. <laughs> Let's see what we can get uh, some more clarification. This is a Job. Oh no, this is the same thing. This is the New American Bible, but I have I'm reserving that for something else. This is the Roman Catholic Bible, but it says almost the same thing as the Hebrew. And then I have another one, which uh, let's see. Let me go to Job. Whoops. Job, the 12th chapter, I thought I had it open to it, but I didn't. I had Psalm 711 open to it. This says, the tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. No change. The modern English language says, the tents of robbers do prosper. Those who provoke God may live securely. Their wants being supplied by God's hand. So, so far, according to the original King James, God is the one that's helping these bandits, robbers, and thieves. <laughs> this is just in one verse. Now, remember, this is what the Bible says. This is the word of God. This is the word coming right out from the mouth of God himself. <laughs> uh huh. And what I did in my book, when I, when, let's see, where did I put that? I guess it's buried under all these Bibles. It is. 
what I did when I translated it from the Aramaic and Lamza translates it a little differently, but it's the same as what I did. But I just said it a little differently. I just made it a li little stronger. Instead of using the word tabernacles, which is an old, old expression, which means the tents, which is either one is correct, tabernacles or tents. The tents of robbers, this is what the Aramaic says, the tents of robbers shall perish. Actually, when I first did that, I wanted to use, instead of shall, I wanted to use the stronger verb that the Aramaic is, which I'm going to tell you now. The tents of robbers will perish. Absolutely perish, not prosper. They will perish. And the assurance of those, they think they're so assured because they have stolen things, kept things, and they think, and those who incite God, because God doesn't, Go for this, stealing, robbing, doing all this kind of thievery, and who incite God. In other words, he's going to make their self-assurance dissipate because it's going to get caught up with them. Because there is no God in their hearts. No word about hands, nothing in there about hands at all. So the Aramaic, it makes it very clear that the tents of robbers are going to be shaken up. They're going to lose. They're going to perish. Their tents and all the things they've stolen is going to perish. And their self-assuredness that they thought well, they were so good, because it's incite God, means they were going against the laws of God. That's what it means, incite God. They're going against uh, the laws of God because there is no God in their hearts. Now, I just read a few of them. There are many other translations to that verse, which are even worse. But I wanted to give you a taste of what it is when people say the Bible says the Bible says. I'm going to correct that statement. What they need to say, it's, they have a right to say it. But what they need to say is say it correctly the translation of a 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 translation says the bible doesn't say that that the tents of robbers prosper and those who anger god are secure no 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 and god brings abundantly into their hands that's a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. And then I showed you all the different later translations. They try to improve on it, but they make it worse. <laughs> so if you're going to go, the Bible doesn't say that at all. It's a translation of the Bible that says that. We're always dealing with translation. Even the Aramaic, Dr. Lambs' translation, is a translation, but it's coming directly from. Aramaic into English. And he's telling you exactly what the Aramaic text says. But if you notice with the Hebrew, they, every, everyone has something different. So how can they be saying they're translating from Hebrew? No, because they're using other English translations and that other people have done, other committees have done. Dr. Lambs' translation of the Bible is the first time we have a Bible done by a translator who is translating from his own native tongue and language. And he was using the ancient biblical language of Aramaic, which they used a lot in the mountain ranges of Kurdistan, where Dr. Lamza was in the Near East, and it was owned by Turkey. We say Kurdistan, but it was owned by Turkey. That's where he was at that time in Marbishu. And... They found these texts there and they brought them there and then they have them in the Smithsonian Institute and now they moved it from there. But I wanted to give you a taste, but let's take this try a little more. Here's something that's really amazing. Job 31.10. This is Job. He's in utter agony. He's in pain. He is sick. His body is racked with pain. He's broke out with boils and cancer all on his skin, skin cancer. 
and then he's arguing with his so-called comforters. This is the 31st chapter and the 10th verse. And the King James version of the Bible says, well, let me, let me just read the scripture and then I'm gonna tell you what he said before he's made this statement. He says, then let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down upon her. Let others bow down upon her. What, what Job is saying here, the verses before, he's saying, if I've ever cheated or lied or done anything wrong, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down upon her. Hmm. What does that mean, bow down upon her? Well, again, we can go with different verses. So in this one, the modern language one, let me go to 31. I think it more or less said what a lot of them changed it to. Instead of bowing down, they said kneel upon her. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Let men <laughs> kneel upon her. And that is 3110. And it has the King James and it has the modern English translation. And it says here, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. Bow down over her. What were they, what are they trying to do? Bowing down over her. The Living Bible, let's see what it has to say. Then may I die and may my wife be in another man's home and someone else become her husband. Well, that's a pretty good guess, isn't it? Okay. And then the revised standard, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down upon her. Well, what does it say? What does it, is it, does, is it the Hebrew change in each time? Kneel, bow down, Get another husband, move into another house. <laughs> Come on now. I've only brought out just two, two of these. And let's see what the, the Catholic Bible, <laughs> what the Catholic Bible says. 3110. Okay. You ready for this? Well, what happened to the 10th verse? Oh, there it is. Then may my wife grind for another and may others cohabit with her. They try to use a nice word there. Instead of kneel, instead of bowing down over her or upon her, it says cohabit with her. Mm. That's why that guy thought about getting a new husband and the one who translated the Amplified, that's what I read earlier, the Amplified. He's amplifying it. He's guessing at what this means instead of what it's really saying. And there's another one, which I no longer have. I gave it away, which actually says, and may she have intercourse with other men. Because it's plural. It's not singular. Let others bow down upon her. Hmm. This is what the Bible says. <laughs> and the, the Jewish one says the same thing as I've been reading. Okay. Now, I translated it, but Lamson says the same thing that I do, but I just say it a little differently. I say here, then let my wife grind meal for others. In other words, may she make the living and let her bake bread. <laughs> it's the verb that means to bake bread. Let her bake bread at another man's place. So grinding the meal and baking bread at another man's place means, may she earn the living for me, which would have been terrible for a patriarch to say concerning his wife, but he's defending himself again. He's talking about, they're accusing him of things he did not do. And that, that's why he's, he's sick and everything's wrong with him. You know, people love to do that. When you get sick, what have you been thinking? What have you done? 
always blame, 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 accuse, accuse, accuse. That's the way of the serpent. That's the way of Satana, Satan. No, let my wife, he says, if I've ever cheated, then let her earn the living. Because he was a wealthy man, but he lost all his wealth. He lost his children. He lost his property. He lost his cattle. He lost everything Job did. And so what's going to happen here? Hmm? So he says, he says, look, if I ever cheated, that oh, I didn't bring this on myself. I did not do anything wrong. And he said, then let my wife, if I've done something like that, let my wife grind meal for others. And let, uh, and let her bake bread at another man's place, not get in bed, <laughs> bake bread. As some of them are, are implicating it in that type of something happening. That is ridiculous. But the Bible says so. The Bible says so. <laughs> no, it doesn't a translation of other translations of a translation of a translation. Before the King James appeared, there were at least nine to 10 other English translations of the Bible. Hmm. So, <laughs> and then think God said this? I doubt that very seriously. But you know, I've argued even with ministers, because I'm gonna tell you one here when we get to Jeremiah, one, one minister was arguing with me something awful on the one in Jeremiah. But I said, okay, I said, okay, you, you take it your way. I, I, didn't, I don't like to argue either. I present it and if it doesn't dawn on them, then I know they don't care about it. They don't really care. They, or they really think God is this awful God that does all these awful things. They, they believe in that kind of God. So I don't try to take it away from them. They can have all of him they want. So in Psalm 7:11. Psalm 711, King James says, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. Every day he's angry with the wicked, of course. This one says here, with the wicked. Okay, <laughs> Psalm 711, that's easy Psalm to remember. So what do these other verses say? This is what I was asked to do. Would you bring out some of the differences in scripture from the Aramaic? I said, okay, here they come. Let me go to Psalm 711 in the Roman Catholic Bible. And let's see what, whoops, I went too far. Let's see what it says here. Seven eleven. Well. Oh, Lord. Doesn't say anything about that at all. A shield before me is God who saves the upright of heart. Ah, it's 12. Psalm 7, 12. They put it in the 12th verse instead of the 11th. Okay. It says here, a just judge is God. Now, that is what the Aramaic says too. A just judge is God. But what does the rest say? A God who punishes day by day. <laughs> oh, I love that one. He is a just judge. Yes, that's why he can punish you day by day. Day by day because... You cannot question God's judgment. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Cannot do that. He's a just judge. So if you're being punished day by day and he's letting you get it, well, you know why? Because he's a just judge and you've got to get it. That's the way Jesus taught God, didn't he? So <laughs> he, he, what Jesus did, he says he went after those who have gone astray, that he might bless them and bring them back into the... But not, oh, he punishes day by day. But you mustn't question that because he's a just judge. That's exactly what that verse is telling us. This is in the Roman Catholic Bible called the New American Bible. <laughs> Interesting. And a lot of other ones say the same thing. Uh, this one here, um, it says, 
that God is indignant every day. They just changed the word from anger and wrath to indignant, just indignant. <laughs> well, what does the Aramaic say? The Aramaic says, God is a just judge, exactly the way that a new American one has it, which is the Aramaic text. So the, the Hebrew must read that way because they got it correct. But it says, and behold, he is not angry every day. <laughs> the psalmist is saying this. He's telling you what he feels about God. God is a just judge, a, a righteous judge, a true judge. So he can't be angry every day. That's what the rest of the, the psalm says in Aramaic. He is not angry every day. <laughs> oh, this is utterly amazing. But uh, because I see time is starting to move, I, I want to move faster on these other ones. I, I wanted to give you just an idea of how many different translations say different things, and for some of them make it worse than even the King James. So here's another one. Isaiah 43. 28. This is Isaiah speaking. And he's talking in the name, he's, he's representing God. And he's saying, Thus says the Lord, therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. Whoa. It's, and you know what the word profane means? It means committing unclean acts, doing certain sexual acts that are not good. And it says, I have, I have, speaking, speaking for the first person of God, I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. You know what the Aramaic says? I'm not going to read you all the other translations. They even make it worse. Your princes have defiled the holy place that is the sanctuary. Therefore, because your princes and your rulers and your officials have committed sexual acts in the holy sanctuary, in the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place, Therefore, I have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to the shame of what they have done. Mm, that's what the Aramaic says. That's much clearer, isn't it? And what's interesting, when I traced through all the Bibles, I couldn't find any of them that corrected that, except Aramaic and except one other, the Greek Septuagint, the Septuagint Greek version of the Old Testament. And it agrees exactly with the Aramaic. And, and the Pshita, that's what I read from, is the Pshita of the Old Testament. And the Septuagint agree on that verse. Some places in the Septuagint does agree with the Aramaic text. In some places, it doesn't. But a lot of times, it does. And so what Isaiah says is this that the noblemen and chiefs and princes of the people defiled God's holy place, the sanctuary. But in the King James, Isaiah claims that God himself has defiled. To defile means to commit impure acts. Interesting. Very, very interesting. And Dr. Lambda says there was about 10 to 12,000 differences. I have never counted. This is what he has said. But I imagine there's even more than that. Because sometimes, even when you have a correct idiom, you don't have the meaning of the idiom. You just have the idiom and not the meaning of it. So therefore, everyone talks about the idiom and not the meaning. So, you know, an idiom is where we say something, but we mean something else. Like, Whew, that guy is hot under the collar, which means <laughs> he's always angry all the time. And, and, and the Bible uses that same 
uses that same expression, but, but a different idiomatic phrase. He says, beware the man whose breath is in his nostrils. <laughs> well, that means we're supposed to avoid every human being on the face of the earth, doesn't it? Because we have, where else are we going to put our breath? But in our nostrils. <laughs> Unless you're in the hospital where they put a tube. But what that means is be aware of a hasty man. <laughs> that's, that's an idiomatic expression. Whose breath is in his nostrils. In other words, he's, he's breathing hard. So beware of the hasty man. Be aware of man who's angry like that. Be aware of someone who's going to get them because his breath is in his nostrils. You want to stop. And, but they, which is correct. That's the literal translation of it. But the meaning is lost, absolutely gone. <laughs> and, that, and Lambda didn't count any of those when he talked about the 10 to 12,000 differences. He was talking about the actual words that were not translated, but there the words are translated correctly, but the meaning is gone. Oh, we can go into many of those different things like that. Can you imagine to stay away from a man whose breath is in his nostrils? Mm -hmm. that, that would be hard to do, wouldn't it? Okay, <laughs> now we go to Jeremiah. This is the one the minister uh, was arguing with me about. And then I'm going to give you one more and then I'll stop because someone asked me to, to do some of the differences in the translation for the program tonight. So I'm doing it. Jeremiah 4.10. Then I said, oh, Lord God, surely you or thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, ye shall have peace. Whereas the sword reaches to the soul. Mm, that's an idiomatic phrase. Reaches to the soul means to the core of a human being. Instead of having peace, we've had war. And the sword went clear to the core of a human being. So into the very essence of the person. It was terrible, terrible war. And so Jeremiah is accusing God of deceiving the people and Jerusalem. Can you imagine Jeremiah doing that? And almost all other translations say the same thing. And this is why I had a hard time talking with this minister about this particular verse. I said, I said, you really think that Jeremiah would say that God deceived? Oh, how greatly, not just deceived the people, but greatly deceived the people. You were really, you really pulled the wool over our eyes, God. You've done really terrible things. And I said it like that to the minister. And you know what the minister said? Yes. Yes. Because Jeremiah was angry with God. That's why he said that to him. Da, 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 da. He explained it, why Jeremiah said it like that. I said, but the Aramaic text doesn't say that at all. And he says, what does the Aramaic text say? The Aramaic text says, then I said, oh, Lord God. I said, I implore, I implore you, oh, God. He's entreating God. Truly, truly, I have deceived this people and Jerusalem exceedingly because I have said, this is what I predicted. I have said, you will have peace. And look, the slaying sword reaches as far as the soul. In other words, I was wrong in my prophetic utterance. And that's why he's imploring the Lord. He's begging God to help him. Oh, Lord God, truly, I have deceived this people. Because I told them they would have peace. Instead, they had war because it was Babylon. Babylon came, and boy, did he do. Nebuchadnezzar came in Babylon. The Chaldeans came, and they really did a number in Jerusalem and in southern, the southern part of Israel, which was Judah. And, and Jeremiah is lamenting the fact that he was wrong. He wasn't blaming God. He wasn't accusing God of, decep of deception. 
he realized he had made an error in, er, error in his prophecy. All the other prophets were saying, yeah, we will conquer Babylon. We will destroy them. We, they, they won't hurt us. And in fact, what, what Jeremiah had to do is they were saying, uh, Jeremiah came with a yoke on his back and neck. And he came before the princes and the courts of Israel. And he said to them, this is how the Babylonians will treat you when they come here. Which means they would become prisoners. He would have that heavy wooden yoke on his neck and on his shoulders, and he would be attached to it. And he demonstrated it to them right in front of their eyes. And the false prophets all came, released him from that heavy yoke of burden, because that's what they did. They had him went out, and the principal one had the major yoke, and everyone else was tied all along the line that they took prisoners into Babylon. But this is these false prophets came, took it off of Jeremiah, and they broke it and said, Thus says the Lord, we will break the yoke of the Chaldeans. Mm. And one time, also, Jeremiah was, a, was almost saying the same thing, but he changed it. And he thought, I have deceived these people. Mm -hmm with that false notion. But then he went back. This time he had an iron yoke on his neck and his shoulders and was carrying it. And they couldn't remove it and they couldn't break it. Let's hear you hear, let's hear your prophecy now. Hmm. This is how the Babylonians will treat you. I have greatly deceived these people. Oh, there's a big difference. And one more, and then I'm going to close with this. I think this is a this is in the New Testament. And I think this is amazing. You know, there's many more in the New Testament. I chose this one because I think, how is this possible? This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. And he says to them in 1 Corinthians 7, 18, he says to them, if any man called being circumcised, if you're circumcised already, If any man being circumcised, let him, let him not become uncircumcised. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Just doesn't make sense at all. Or if you're uncircumcised, let him not try to be circumcised. Guess what some other Bibles say about it. What in the heck is Paul talking about? How is that possible? If any man were, if any man were circumcised when he was called, that is, became a follower of Jesus, let him not turn to the party of the uncircumcised. Let him not turn to the party of the uncircumcised. In other words, the, during the during this time in the church, they had two different groups. Some were saying you had, to, even though you, you may be uh, Syrian or you may be Aramean or you may be uh, some other thing, don't join, the, uh, uh, become a party of the uncircumcised. So, yeah, you got to be, become part of this party. In other words, it was dividing the church, those who were circumcised, who were Jewish, and those who were not circumcised. And they were arguing over that over the becoming a party of the uncircumcised. Don't join the party of the uncircumcised. <laughs> Not this other way, it's impossible. So I've just given you just a few examples. I said this about 10 to 12,000 differences. This, and you know, and how about the words of Jesus on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was not forsaken on the cross or the Lord's prayer where he says, we, we ask God, don't lead us into temptation. No, as I told you the last time, Tatlin means, and do not let us enter into temptation. Let us not enter into temptation. That's another way 
say it. Let us not enter into temptation. Keep me out of it. This is your prayer. Hmm? Prevent me from getting into trouble. So this is the meaning. There's so many, there's, as I said, plenty of them. There you have, I answered one of the questions. This is some of the things that make a difference. Now, I just did translation work. I just did idioms. You have to know culture. You have to know the psychology of the people. You have to know what is being said, what they mean, all the different nuances and shades of meanings with words. You cannot do it just with a translation alone. This is why the commentaries were written, why Dr. Lamb's original commentaries, which he started in the 1940s, he did a commentary on the gospel. And then, and first he translated the four gospels, then he did the commentary, which is 1936 on the four gospels. Then he did, and then he did a New Testament commentary in the 1940s. And in 1964, he, trans, he did a commentary on the entire Old Testament. It took him years to do that one, 1964. And I have that one. I have the, when it was first published, I grabbed it, the first thing. I still have it on my shelf here. It's literally falling apart because I had it in 1964. And um, I had a lot, still a lot of questions. He didn't answer a lot of things I knew had to be answered. That's why we had to work together and fill out those things he did not answer and that's why we have all these different commentaries now and this was his dream this is how he wanted the commentaries and he only had four in the 40s 30s 40s well three on the new testament two on the new testament pardon me just two on the new testament and one on the old testament 64 when i met him then he did another one on the New Testament, which Doubleday published called More Light on the Gospel. And then after that, we worked on some more and that was the end of it. So there were four, but later on, this is what we did, which you see behind me here, all these books right here. That was his driven at what he was always hoping to do, to have separate books all on and on the different books of the Bible, the commentary to invite the people into the culture, invite the people into the language, not just the translation difference, but explaining why and how the differences occurred and why and what was an idiom and what was a, a, a vision or a dream. You'd be surprised how many things were recorded that people think actually literally happened when it was a vision or a dream. Lot when we lot and the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah actually took place, but the angels visiting Lot was his dream, and he dreamed he was outside and met the two angels coming from Abraham, and there the angels told him this place was going to be destroyed, and when he told his family later on, they didn't believe him. That's why just his wife and his two girls left they fled they believed in what their father's vision and dream was they saw it but no two angels literally visited lot this was a dream and those men trying to attack him in his dream when they came and they said uh well, who are these who are these men that you have with you and he said don't oh, know you must do that they're under my protection and he says he was wanting to give him his daughters just to protect because this was the eastern way to protect them this was in his dream and the angels pulled him on the inside slammed the door and then spoke and all the men went blind all those men that wanted to do the rape scene went blind they just totally went blind this is in his dream hmm? let me tell you if that literally have happened when the next day when he went to warn his family and stuff about that Sodom and Gomorrah was going to be destroyed because of the dream he had, if it was literal, they would have heard about all those men that attacked Lot and his and his family and and the two messengers who were there under his protection and guidance. They 
they would have spread it like wow but we can't see we're blind da, 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 da. with these two men in there they blinded us with a, some miraculous thing no 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 that was in a dream that was a dream and yet people teach it that it was literal you'd be surprised how much was a dream 40 percent of what we call the old testament is based on visions and dreams and people take it all literally so oh there is so much in the scriptures if you when you once you get into scripture from the aramaic and the near eastern culture language psychology idiomatic expressions it changes everything and it makes sense now the bible makes sense so when you hear them say the bible says the bible says no a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation says and i didn't quote all the translation and it still applies today it hasn't changed the aramaic helps clarify what the scriptures are saying okay let's see if we have some questions going here i have a couple robbie Oh, you were there, Hanny. I didn't see you come on. Yeah, I've been here. Um, one of the questions is, what, what does the Western Christians claim is the original text of the Bible? Greek. That's for the New Testament and Hebrew yeah. for the old. Hebrew for the whole. Old, yes. Yeah. And another question for you is, you've been... You've been teaching through ministry, keynote speaking, and writing for so many years. What made you decide now to not hold back? Well, because people were, were they were tighter then than they are today. And not only that, I'm getting older, and pretty soon I won't be here. So I'm just going to let it go. And people can think what they want to think act the way they want to act, get angry if they want to get angry, walk out, which they have done. They did that even when I was, wasn't was telling everything. Uh, I'm just letting it go now. People need to know. They need to know. And there's so many hungry people that are wanting to hear this. They, they know it on the inside. I'm really not telling them anything new. They felt it on the inside. In fact, lots of times where I've ever lectured in different places and i've lectured all over the united states as well as in england and scotland and ireland and, and germany and 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 different other places all over in europe because people know there's something wrong with the way it is written here but they don't know what it is and then the preachers pound it and hit it and say this is what the bible says and no no it it was just even Dr. Lamsay, the reason why he didn't translate certain things, he kept the word Christ, he kept certain words, Jesus, he kept all the apostles' name the same, all, all of that, because this is what we were used to. Well, it's time for that to be over. It's time for the veil to be cut away. And this light and it's light some people don't consider it light they consider it darkness fine you consider it darkness keep the darkness and go just like when that minister was arguing with me over jeremiah that Jer even when i read what jeremiah really was saying he said to me i still don't believe that and i said well that's okay i says keep it i said go ahead and believe jeremiah is accusing God of being one of the worst deceptors on the one who deceives and and does all these terrible things. I said, fine, believe it. That's not that doesn't touch me at all. Well, but I said, this is what the Aramaic says. I'm just presenting it. If you can't take it, fine. I I don't hold it against you. I said, but that's what you want to believe. Believe it. But this is what the Aramaic says. And you have to do that with people. People are so grounded. You see, he's, this is what he learned in seminary. And when you learn it in seminary, it sticks. <laughs> Just like this Yamamuchi man who called Lamza grandiose because he called the Church of the East the Church of the East. How dare you call it the Church of the East? You're grandiose. Well, so is Professor Hitty, 
from uh, the university teaching. Uh, uh, he's no longer there because he's gone now for Professor Ethi. And all, and all these books I have on the Church of the East now and the lost history of Christianity th th that you can get now on Amazon, all the, the, everything I used to say, people used to think, what hogwash, what baloney. And now all these history books are coming out with it. Uh, the Church of the East, the Church of the East. And yet that, that Professor Yamamuchi, he said, oh, no, 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 no such thing. This Dr. Lamza was grandiose. They always attack the person. Always attack the person. Religious people do it, but politicians do it. Just to make them look bad, attack the person, attack the person, find anything bad about them. Say they, they're of Satan, say they're Antichrist, say they're this. I've had that said about me, that Dr. Lamza, when I was working with Dr. Lamza, he was the Antichrist and I was his assistant. I was assistant to the Antichrist. Why were we the Antichrist? Why were we a part of that? Because we didn't follow their belief system, their belief system. And you know how do you abbreviate belief system, don't you? If you don't know how to abbreviate belief system, then I'm not going to tell you. But <laughs> so there you have it. There you have it. You cannot change him. You leave him. Leave him. Jesus knew this. This is why he says, I have sheep of other and other foes that will hear my voice. I only go to those who hear my voice. And at the time, I was holding back because of some of these people there always accusing me of different things. If they only knew how much I did know that didn't, I didn't reveal, <laughs> I would have been the prince of hell. Mm -hmm. But, and Dr. Lamza did the same. As he told me when we were, when we were working together and lecturing together, he told me, heat the iron slowly. Yeah, heat the iron, but heat it slowly. You don't want to burn the clothes. <laughs> That's what he told me. You don't want to burn the clothes. Just heat the iron slowly. Mm, yeah, I used to always heat it slowly all the time. And just a little bit that I did say, I got flack. But I don't care anymore. I don't care. It needs to be known. It needs to be said. Mm. And you either stand for it or you don't. So I just say it. Some places I do go, I can feel, I can feel the people. And when I feel the freedom, I go ahead and do it. When I don't feel the freedom, I don't do it. It has to come from the inside of me. It has to come with the freedom of the spirit. Okay, what's another question? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't have any more questions. There is a statement about uh, the Africanas, Africans Bible uh, was originally, they, they believed that the... Um, Old Testament was written in Aramaic, and they translate from that. So the translation is closer to what you've been reading, while the New Testament is, is they, they claim, was uh, done in Greek originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I Just, read that one. I have that African one, the translation of it. Some of it doesn't agree totally with the Aramaic, So, yeah. uh, but some of it does. Okay, here, I have a, several questions here. I tell you, it comes to the side of my screen for me to read it. Let me go, let me see what it is here. You don't have these, Hanny? No, that's that's all I have. What is the Aramaic word for death? Oh, this is interesting, the Aramaic word for death. It comes from Mwata. It comes from where, where they got this word from, the ancient god, the ancient god, death. He was a god, death was a god. And his name was Mot, M O. T. And then the Aramaic words derived from that, because from, from the cuneiform, mot, because they, uh, they believe the god of death came to take you. You just didn't die. The god of death brings it. And, and it's that same, is the god's name, M-O-T, mot, is the same way we, we do it for the Aramaic word. And Dr. Lamza said, but in the ancient world, uh, under Christianity and under um, even the Old Testament, that, that they believed that death meant not here, but present elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Again, it's the interpretation of the word. Mm -hmm. 
which is very interesting. Welcome to tonight's session. Have a Q&A. Okay, Robbie, thank you for another beautiful class explaining the scriptures in Aramaic, which makes sense. Oh, thank you. What is the name of the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament? I already have the Aramaic translation. Oh, hi. Oh, the name of it is Peshitta. Peshitta. I know. Let me get the Bible here. Uh, they don't put. Yeah, there it is. On the very bottom, it says here. P-E-S-H-I. And that is very not good in English. It's just not good at all. S-H-I-T? Come on now. And you have a hard time pronouncing it. But let me tell you, in Aramaic, it is sheet, sheet, like sheets you put on the bed, a sheet of ice, a, a sheet of glass. <laughs> That's because it's not an I. It's the letter Yod, the letter Yod, and it has a dot underneath it. And, and it, it, it becomes then a vowel. And the vowel is a double E sound. So it should be P-S-H-E-E-T-T-A, Peshita. That's how we pronounce it. Don't say it the other way. <laughs> Don't say it the other way. It's Peshita. And that's because of it. when 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 they first discovered, you know, the reason why we got that bad translation into English is because, and that's why Lamza kept it because people weren't familiar with it. It's when they discovered the Aramaic, only they called it Syriac in the 1800s, the late eight, in middle 1800s and onward, and they got the, the text. I have. Let me see if I still have. It. Oh no, I put it back up on the. I have the New Testament in what they call the Peshito, the Peshito, because the final alap becomes an O sound in Western Aramaic. In Western Aramaic, and they don't say Allaha, they say Allaho. And, they, and they, that's how they use it in the Western Aramaic. Eastern Aramaic is, is an open ah sound, Peshita. And so that came first. And because they didn't know about this, because it was a yod and a dot, they thought it was an I. So that's why they got Peshit, the way we, we say it in English. But it's Peshita, Peshita, which means simple, direct, pure, original. That's what that means in the Aramaic. So that's how you pronounce it, Peshita. But everyone's spelling it this way. If you try to look it up, you have to spell it the way they have it here. and that's that because of the 1800s, the way they did it when, when we first got knowledge about Aramaic, but they called it Syriac. Suriaya is what they call it. Okay, let's go on. What is the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament? Yeah, I already did that one. What did Jesus mean when he told his followers not to leave until the Holy Spirit came to baptize them? Well, it means wait until you're empowered is what that means. Wait until you're empowered where you really feel you, you will get a full immersion into it. That's what that means in the book of Acts. Okay. Tonight was wonderful. I'm so appreciative of the understanding you give on so many levels and the clarification that you provide. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, another thank you. Too much misinformation in translation without without respective Aramaic, okay? And like, and just like they always attacked Ishua, yes. How did you manage Texas for so many decades? Texas is so extreme. No, there's a lot of open, loving people. The, the, the Pentecostal church that I was in, Calvary Missionary Church, it was very open very open we always had a mixture of people we had even people methodists episcopalians and um uh, not many baptists but right here in the south too it's the same way and here in atlanta and, and then we had a lot of other people from from other churches that came when when the aramaic came we we, we really filled the churches 
when Dr. Lamza was there and uh, when I brought him all over Texas, he was on the radio. He and and you know that was very popular then, in in the seventies and sixties and seventies, and he was that's when he debated with Madeline Murray O'Hare, and then uh, on on that Alan Dale show, and and the, Texas there's still open people in Texas too. Mm -hmm. There was especially in San Antonio. It is tighter. But it's still, there still were people who were wide open, who were hungry. That there's always a remnant everywhere. I don't care where you are. You there is a remnant everywhere. Okay. Uh, your presentation at UTM last Sunday was so amazing. Can't wait for part two. Thank you. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I think that was the last one. There's no more after that. Oh, do you recommend we purchase Dr. Lamb's translation if we are just starting out? Oh, yes, most definitely. I do recommend it. And but you get the commentaries, got to get the commentaries along with it and to understand so many of the things that are being said. OK, I, I'm speaking. Uh, I did part one on the birth of Jesus. I'm going to do a little bit on December 10th, but not as much as I'm doing for the UTM. That's the uh, Universal Truth Ministries. And uh, on Sunday night, and this will be the second part, I did the first part. And I'm going to do, on December 10th, I'm going to read you my translation of Luke on Jesus' birth. Uh, that's for us on December 10th. I did that for UTM. But uh, I'm going to do Matthew. I did Luke for UTM this past Sunday and explained a lot about Jesus. And then I also am gonna do part two this coming Sunday at seven o'clock, seven o'clock. And if you want to join in, you can, it's, it's just a church service and it starts at seven. And if you want the link to get on, go to our website and go to the uh, schedule of of different speaking engagements I have and go to uh, UTM, Universal Truth Ministries, and there will be the link for you to link on there. And, it, and, and when you get to UTM, sometimes then you have to click on to get, to get in, they'll let you in. But uh, let's see, some of them are already there, ready to get in before seven o'clock, but because they have singing, it's a regular church service. They have singing, they have meditation, they have all of that. And I start about 7.25 or 7.30 and I go for about 30 or 40 minutes. And I've gone way over my time tonight. I'm sorry, I just had too many things. Don't forget, December 10th, we're gonna be celebrating Christmas celebration together. We're gonna to have the, the whole staff with us. It's gonna be wonderful. And I'm gonna do some teaching of like what I did for UTM, but not all of it, can't, because I've got so many things. I'm gonna show you so many things for what, what we're gonna do. Not only our staff, and they're gonna be speaking, but we have an Assyrian guest that's gonna be on there with us, Rebecca Johns. And you don't wanna miss that, and what she has to say to us. And, uh, and she's Assyrian. And, and her dad knew Dr. Lamza and oh, it, it's just, we have a lot of things pre prepared for you for December 10th. And you can also ask questions and I'm gonna be showing you different things. Uh, the map of where Dr. Lamza came from. I'm gonna be showing you things about the Garden of Eden. I'm gonna have the, the pictures of the terrain and oh, just a lot of wonderful things. And some other things I'm gonna tell you too, a, a few little stories. But it, it's for you to become more and more acquainted with us. This is why I just opened it up for everyone. And before we start the classes again in January, I'm talking about the Aramaic School of Life, which I do every second Saturday of each month, but it won't be until February. I'm not doing any in January. We are having the Wednesday night classes. Next Wednesday will be our last class. Let me double check that. I have it here in the calendar. Yeah. Yes, the 20th is our last Wednesday class of the year, next Wednesday. 
the 27th, which is the vacation week and Christmas, and the first week in January, no Wednesday night. So no Wednesday night on the 27th of December and on the 3rd of January, okay? But we start again January 10th. And we'll send a notice out in case you forget and start to join us. But next Wednesday will be the last class for the year on Wednesday night. And we'll miss two weeks after that. Okay, I think that's all the announcements. And by the way, if you haven't signed up to register for Saturday, please do so. We already have 150 registrations right now. And we are limited in how many we can have because we can only pay for so many that attend. So we're almost close to the limitation. So please, if you haven't registered for December 10th, do it now. That's from one until three. Okay. Love you, everyone. Have a good rest of the week. Be healthy. Be joyful. Until then. <laughs>